Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're addressing the parts of the old law which remain valid and grave today, the Ten Commandments. So far, we've talked about the first six commandments, and now it's time for the seventh, Thou shalt not steal. We've discussed what it means to steal and how possessions are supposed to work according to the will of God. This week, what's intellectual property? Can it involve stealing? Intellectual property is a distinction in the legal process by which the creator of an idea is granted exclusive rights to make use of their ideas or mental creations. These rights can then be traded like any other possession, or others might be allowed to make use of them through what's called a license. Intellectual property is often a poorly understood legal concept, but does it refer to anything real? Is intellectual property a viable concept? It seems that if it is a viable concept, then stealing intellectual property would be the same as stealing physical property. Even using the property without license would be essentially the same as borrowing it, a topic we covered in episode 116. However, if intellectual property is not a viable concept, none of this is the same as stealing. In fact, all laws depending on intellectual property would be unsupportive of justice. It may surprise certain people to learn that intellectual property as such didn't exist until the late 19th century, and the various principles behind it or similar to it didn't exist for more than a few hundred years before that. For most of human history, the ideas of intellectual property just didn't exist. So, what does the Catholic Church say about it? Well, again, it seems that there's really very little in Catholic Church teaching for or against the concept of intellectual property. Pope John Paul II once remarked on how all properties share the common destiny of being created for mankind, and therefore that they mustn't be used to harm other people, so even if intellectual property is a viable concept, it would merely be bound by the same rules as any property, and anyone using it to harm people would be guilty of an injustice. Because there's no explicit teaching on this topic, as far as I can see, it's up to reason to resolve this problem. The first issue with the notion of intellectual property is that it recognizes no difference between one person's thoughts and another person's. For example, if you come up with the idea for a man who wanders through the world planting pear trees and then own the copyright on it, what happens if I think of the same idea halfway across the world? Did I not think of the idea just because you thought of it first? I think the answer is clearly not. Do I deserve less recognition for inventing the concept? Did it require less creativity on my part? Again, no. Yet, you can force me to never publish anything pertaining to this character that I invented solely because by the merest coincidence he happened to be similar to yours. However, it gets worse than this. Suppose that I had heard of this character, thought up a story about him, and told this story to my niece. You have a copyright on the product of your own thoughts, but my thoughts, though influenced by yours, are still my thoughts. This seems to imply that intellectual property is to do with concepts and patterns of thoughts. But how can you own a pattern of thoughts? Wouldn't doing so ultimately prevent people from being able to freely think certain things? My thoughts are different from yours because I'm a different person than you are. Therefore, it doesn't make much sense to speak of you owning thoughts that are mine, even if I develop them through association with your creations. Intellectual property must refer to a pattern of ideas because all trade is conducted through the exchange of goods and services. Intellectual property is clearly not a service because after you've created it, you don't really do anything, so it must be a good. But if it's a good, it's not a physical good, so it must be a metaphysical good. This is why I say that intellectual property can only refer to patterns of ideas. However, if the same pattern of ideas can be developed independently by two or more people halfway across the world from one another, how can ownership of these ideas possibly be determined? How can they continue to be owned once they become the ideas of another person? A few hundred years ago, the issue was settled much differently. The creation of books, songs, and other works of art was not the creation of an idea, but of a piece of art, which was either a service or a material good. This was why Ludwig van Beethoven and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart didn't stop writing music and let the cash flow in after writing their first symphonies. These works were treated as individual services and purchased as commissions. This means that they were paid to write the music and that was that. They didn't continue to receive money every time someone played their symphonies because they weren't performing a service anymore. Were they cheated? In the modern world, everyone wants to be an artist, and it's not because they're particularly talented or because the work is easy. 
The reason is that unlike 9 to 5 data entry jobs down the street, artists continue reaping money from their properties after they've finished all the actual work. This has not led to the protection of our rights, and in fact, has unbalanced the wealth of whole nations, as more and more money flows into the pockets of super-rich actors, musicians, authors, and directors, people who haven't earned it all, and in many cases, don't know how to use it properly. When all the evidence is in, we can look at the issue of intellectual property and ask ourselves, is it a viable concept? The answer is... probably not. From this it follows that intellectual property laws are probably not just, nor aimed at the protection of people's rights. However, just because the law has no basis doesn't let us off the hook when it comes to obeying it. As we discussed with respect to the Fourth Commandment, we should only disobey legitimate authority figures if we're morally obligated to, if obeying them would involve doing something truly wrong. It's not immoral to not illegally download music, and therefore we're still obligated to obey these laws, regardless of how groundless they may be. However, this is just one more reason why people need to stick close to the truth and never deviate from it. It causes all sorts of suffering if you start off in that direction. Next time, what does it mean to bear false witness against your neighbor? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.